Overcoming Assumptions That Inhibit Spiritual Development A lecture by Idris Shah, delivered in 1976 before a live audience. This lecture was previously entitled A Psychology of the East. Talking of assumptions, when I was here last in San Francisco, it's in April and May, I was in this very room and I walked up roughly to where I am now here, and although there were very few people in the room whom I had met before, there was a burst of laughter, you know. And this made me, you know, a bit sort of, I was wondering if you were all, uh, had ESP or something. And I didn't really know what it meant. But a lot of people wrote to me after this, and one of them who seemed more friendly than many of the others were, invited me to ask him any questions. And I said, right. Could you tell me why everybody laughed when I walked up? It's like, you know, they laughed when I sat down at the piano or sort something. Of you know, why did they laugh as soon as they saw me? And he told me that that was an assumption. The assumption was that I had walked up very quietly and slowly and perhaps slightly stiffly to the microphone and did not show my teeth. In America, it's only Jack Benny that doesn't show his teeth. And he's a funny man, they say. Yeah. Well, all right, so will you consider my teeth shown for today? Now, now, since we are here in California, something which I made the assumption once upon a time could never possibly happen to me, uh, but it has, I just want to read us into the assumption situation which hopefully is being dissolved here. Some of you may have heard of J.B. Priestley, a famous British writer. He wrote in 1957, I looked him up because when I was coming to California, I had to know something about it, you see, and he says, California, that advanced post of our civilization with its charlatan philosophies and religions, its lack of anything old or well tried, its total absence of anything rooted in tradition or character. <laughs> well, now. So I had the usual assumptions about California, and I'm still suffering from the euphoria of finding out that, you know, it isn't like that at all. So I want to go on that record because I want to come back to California. <laughs> well, now, here's another assumption. I nearly didn't come to California because a friend of mine once annoyed the whole American audience by telling them, they, you know, somebody asked him, how long would it take to stabilize the western areas of the United States? And he said, 300 years. And they were very angry with him. But here's an interesting thing of the assumption thing, because they didn't know, although they were Americans, that he had taken Thomas Jefferson's estimate of a thousand years and knocked off 70% of it from, <laughs> from courtesy. So you see where we are with assumptions. I have a lot here about California, but uh, <laughs> I don't think it really does work so well. Besides, I want to get on to my all-purpose lecture. Now, there is an ancient tale told by the Sufis about a wise man who once told a king about a remarkable tree which was found only in India. People who ate of the fruit of this tree, as he told it, would neither grow old nor die. And this legend so excited the king to whom he was told that he immediately, of course, conceived a passionate desire for the tree and for the fruit, not to grow old, not to die ever. And so he sent a resourceful representative to find and to bring back the fruit of that tree. Now, for many years, this emissary traveled through one city after another, all over India. He diligently asked everybody about where the tree might be found, what it was like, and so on. And after some years, he began to register that. He wasn't getting anywhere. Some people laughed at him, some people kicked him, some people humored him, and uh, he didn't find the tree. Of course, a lot of them told him false tales, sent him from one destination to another, and so on and so on. You can fill in the rest yourself. Well, now, ultimately, he lost all hope of success. He thought, there is no such tree. There's no such tree here at all or else it can't be found. So he decided to return whatever the cost to the royal court of his master who'd sent him from, shall we say, Iran or somewhere. But he heard at the last moment of a wise man of great sanctity whom he determined to go and see just to get a blessing from him. He'd given up the tree thing and he said, yeah, I'll get a blessing. It's a long journey. 
So he went to see the old man who said, why did you come here? And he said, well, it's this tree business. Uh, there is this tree, and they say there is, and it gives you wisdom, and you never die, and I haven't been able to find it, and the king will probably kill me anyway. So I need a blessing, you know, rather more than somewhat. So on the stage, of course, as sages are allowed to do, uh, more serious seekers after truth, like you and me, are not allowed to do it so much. But the sage who was allowed to laugh, you see. And he said, ha, 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 he laughed, he laughed, he laughed. He said, you simpleton, wisdom is the fruit of the tree of knowledge. And that's what you're really looking for. But because you have taken images and form, secondary names for things as your aim, you will not be able to find what lies behind. I mean, the tree of knowledge is an image. There is a knowledge. And we have to concretize it in some way in order to approach nearer to it, but not in order to find it. You can't actually find it until the intermediary, secondary thing uh, has dissolved, which brought you here. For example, he says the tree, mind you, this may strike you as a bit Indian and not quite as sort of concrete as some of the stuff you may have heard me say and others, but the tree of knowledge could be the water of life, the sun, an ocean, even a cloud. We adhere to that principle too. But if you take a secondary thing, you won't really be able to get to the primary thing illustrating this rule or law of gravity does not necessarily illustrate circularity or um, scotch tape adequately for us to be able to understand its true reality. Mutatis mutandis, changing things in accordance with the uh, subject about which we are talking. So, hence the need for study, hence the need for learning, hence the need for understanding. The ordinary human assumption system does prevent us from learning, as well as protecting us in many ways, only when we are unable to set assumptions aside, or when, for instance, an assumption becomes everything. This is true, this is real, this is totally real, therefore nothing else can be real. Now, in many countries of the East, and perhaps most of the West, of which we talk when we mean the West, we usually don't mean the Balkans or something. We usually mean Western Europe and, <laughs> and white Anglo-Saxon Protestant America or something. I don't know. Um, mostly, the West has produced its magnificent civilization through cleaving to certain assumptions which we might regard as oversimplifications. Now, I think that the time has come when we've got what economists call a little bit of spare capacity here now. Your civilization isn't going to collapse if some of you become whatever you, is now called uh, what used to be hippies or crazy people or religious experimenters or whatever. You don't need all your brains. You can afford wastage. You can spend some of your time doing ridiculous things like reading books, even written or slung together by people like me, uh, without losing too much. In other words, the price is really no longer as hard. You're not defending the left hemisphere of the brain against the encroachments of um, barbarism. You're all right, you've got spare capacity. So you've only got certain problems left. I mean, one of them is you are in danger of trivializing the whole thing. You're in danger of looking for easy answers. You're in danger of being interested by things which you have decided will be interesting or are interesting. You're in danger of becoming the... Uh, I nearly said natural prey, but I mean the beneficiaries of the Hindu guru system. You are and in this danger, but aren't we all in some danger of some kind at some time, or in some danger at all time? If you want safety, as Saadi the Persian poet once said, it is on the shore. In the sea there are riches beyond compare, but if you want safety, it is on the shore. So there are risks. Now, my interest is informational and instrumental, shall we say. That is to say, I do insist that with insufficient information you cannot develop the sort of perceptions which I am assuming you might be interested in. Instrumental means somebody's got to mediate such a process, which that is being claimed anyway. Those people who don't believe this, of course, are not invited to listen to any more of this, <laughs> of this discussion. And indeed, uh, you may already have had quite enough of this, because as I was saying to somebody before I came up here, it is a bit difficult, as your guest, as it were, to have to remind you that 
I can say what I have to say to you in three and a half minutes, but I've got to take two hours because <laughs> we buy and sell our knowledge by weight and shape and size in this country, in this civilization. So, so uh, <laughs> I'm sorry, you know, I, I'm embarrassed to have to say it, but <laughs> rather than I should say it, who believe myself to be in enormously friendly disposed towards you, I'll pull my jaw in. <laughs> <laughs> So we all belong to communities which hold certain assumptions about life and about thought and about what we want and so on. And these assumptions are difficult to change. People are always trying to get us to change our assumption system. So we get converted from one thing to another or they try to do it to us. Now I'm trying to modify the assumption system because we haven't got to that stage yet. We've only just got Professor Tart telling us about the assumption system itself. So we can't expect to have got to the stage where anybody's yet thought of very much except a few Sufis a thousand years ago, a uh, question of modifying assumptions. I was going to speak about the New Guinea uh, cargo cult and uh, headhunters, but suffice it to say that it has been determined in New Guinea that if a young New Guinea headhunting brave, as it were, wants to marry a girl, he must cut off somebody's head and take it to his intended father-in-law as an offering. And if he is prevented from doing this, and alas, they are, there's no such thing really as a permissive society there. If he is prevented from cutting off somebody's head, he shows symptoms of considerable shock, uh, remorse, and guilt. His manliness is questioned. This still happens. So, when we are trying to deal with people who have an assumption system, and that means everybody, as you may have seen in some of the stuff we have published, we hammer away at what we call the all soup has lumps in it syndrome, which means, of course, the old story about the man who had been brought up to have soup with lumps in it, and somebody offered him some soup, of course, he thought it couldn't be soup because it didn't have lumps in it. And so we call this the all soups has lumps in it syndrome. Now, this problem of assumptions is not new, is not strange, is not unusual. We have to have some sort of a framework, some sort of a model in our mind, some way of approaching the world and making sense of it. What we do need, however, is to be able to acquire more flexibility. Now, in the Western world, usually, we tend not to look for something which we don't know about already. But if we have no assumptions about something, it's very difficult for us to approach it. So, when an advertiser is trying to get you to buy a product, or somebody's trying to convert you, and so on, he has to build up on your assumption system. My father, and he published this in a book in the 1930s, went to Ceylon, and he ran into a cannibal who was a, I think he was an Englishman or a Dutchman, who was settled in Ceylon, and he was a cannibal. And my father actually publishes this man's arguments, which he found quite plausible. They started out with, I don't remember them all, but you see the interesting insidiousness of this. He says, well, after all, says the cannibal, milk is really only white blood, isn't it? <laughs> so, you see, milk, yes. Well, I mean, <laughs> how easy. You see, that's why my father had to get out quick. He got out <laughs> before it went very much further, but there you are. Now, assumptions are our business, as it were, because what I am trying to do is a kind of a complicated country trick by which I induce you to accept some assumptions as working hypotheses in order to enable you to investigate a number of systems purporting to be uh, in the higher consciousness range, which we call, we don't call, but you call Sufism. The word was invented by Professor August Tholuck in 1823 in Germany, by the way, Sufism. However, to induce you to approach this, I have to use a kind of semaphore built up out of bits and pieces, words like guru and words like higher consciousness and words like illumination, a bit of this and a bit of that, because we don't have any acceptable perspective or framework for it. Now, when I was looking through a book first published about 900 years ago, Al-Ghazali's Hiyal Ulum Din, uh, no, actually, it was not. It was his deliverance from error, I'm sorry. I came across this passage. He was a Sufi. He says, people can only be told things which accord with their observations and reasonings or what they have been told. I rather suspect from the way in which this is written 
that it's a transcription of a lecture which he gave. Now here is a thing which he says, rational people will deny if I state it to them, 900 years ago, quote, is it possible for there to be in the world a thing, perhaps only the size of a grain, which if placed in a town, will consume that town in all its entirety and then consume itself so that virtually nothing is left of the town and what it contained? If I tell you that, you will say, no, how absurd, it must be an old wives tale. Well, that is Al-Ghazali. Until quite recently, people wouldn't think you could destroy large things by means of small things. I hope it never happens again. Of course, as we say in England, it don't half make you think. When we are trying to interest an audience, a community, a number of people, in what we are trying to communicate, we have this problem that societies which are stabilized on a whole range of interlocking assumptions, many of which seem to verify one another, tend to feel themselves threatened by something which cannot be rationally inserted into any space left available in the thinking systems of that society. That is why people grow beards, wear turbans, spin like dervishes and behave in a weird way. They feel themselves constrained, even in California, I'm sure, subconsciously, to create for themselves a new community because they feel that it is incompatible with membership of the ordinary, normal, civilized or square or conventional community to do the kind of things which are connected with their search for higher consciousness or whatever. Now, I'm putting the best possible interpretation on it. You may say they're exhibitionists and so on, or they're quite right, but in the best possible way, after all, why should there not be any normal people among them who are doing this for some reason, which, although subconscious, is coherent, coherently to be understood? One result of that is that we get these artificial tribes produced a new kind of little mini-culture. Or else we get trivialization. Trivialization is, of course, we must render what we are trying to do in your, in quotes, terms. Which means, of course, that we have to provide you with um, Sufi hamburgers, Sufi hymns, Sufi rats and mice, and so on. Now, we can't do that. But we also have two eyes and nose and a mouth, as we say in my country. We are not as different, not as crazy, not as a way out as you might think. That might be a disappointment. But we have specialized in a certain technology as you have in another one. It is your assumption more than ours that there is a dissonance between this or that the one is incompatible with the other. If, however, you have a social need to believe, I mean, the present company always accepted, I, I, a social need to believe that you've got to go into something strange, then I think it would be very useful if we get that uh, settled now, we establish it as an assumption, and then actually you'll be able to find the strange thing much easier if you know what you want. That's part of human history, that if you know what you want, you can get it more easily than if you don't quite know what you want, but you think it's something else you want. So I give you that for nothing. All you need to do is to find out, as it were, what you want. You can test this. If you want emotional stimulus beyond a certain point, you can soon check it. You know, what am I feeling? Well, I'm feeling... Like, man, I'm kind of special, so that means emotional stimulus. So you can go and get it from almost anything, and you can get it from socially acceptable or other sources according to whatever turns you on. And leave us to get on with the other thing, the kind of business we are in. You will not have failed to observe that I'm talking not didactically at all, but descriptively. In fact, I am attempting to give you a general view, a general diagnosis, not a general theory, but at least an external vision of how one sees the behavior of people who believe, because of a certain range of assumptions, that they are engaged in a inner purposeful study of some sort. I nearly said coherent, but they wouldn't claim that purposeful study. But I'm saying we haven't yet got to the point of purposeful study yet. And we cannot do so in a society whose assumptions as we have called it, cannot bear the weight, like the cargo cultists, cannot bear the weight of a more sophisticated and flexible way of doing things. By that I mean that if you continue to believe that the more emotional stimulus you get, the better it is, you continue to believe that various other things which are incompatible with the way in which we do our teaching, such as 
we don't have to wear funny clothes or be un we have to speak broken English. I can speak broken English if it will help. <laughs> uh, we don't have to do that. But if you can't give that up, as it were, if you can't give up this need to hear it, not like it is, but from a fellow who speaks broken English, or I can speak with any accent which you might find totally interesting and I can even do low-touch position. Do you think that is better, you know? But I have not found it so. I have not found it so. So there is a limit to which I am able to dovetail, as it were, with your assumptions, you know. Uh, I, uh, I'm glad you're not cannibals and don't drink blood, but uh, I'm not going to speak broken English if I can get away with whatever it is I'm speaking now. I can't yet speak your way, which I'm sure is the very best way, but I think... <laughs> <laughs> right now, we are talking about Sufi thought, or I am, and try to stop me. Now we're trying to talk about this Sufi thing as a psychology, or at least under the rubric, a word used by American scholars incidentally, I found it recently, I think it's a wonderful one, under the rubric of psychology. Okay, now, what do we have to say about this problem of assumptions which stand in the way of learning the kind of thing that we say can be learned? Well, in addition to what I've already said about this, we do regard the reliance upon secondary things beyond a certain point as what you would call totemism, and we really regard it as immaturity. That is to say, when we find a community of people or an individual who find it necessary to rely on externals, physical objects and so on, to uh, give them uh, a spiritual satisfaction or excitement, we regard that as diagnostic of immaturity or regression to an earlier state. I mean, you can get a perfectly mature person and regress them to dependency on a totem. And that is certainly independently discovered, as it were. I haven't taken this out of your psychology. Now, this need, the need to be an autonomous individual, isn't uh, very strongly marked, contrary to popular belief, in many Western countries. People have made a very great virtue out of, uh, you know, gee, the company's been good to me from cradle to grave type of thing. Uh, and even in more acceptable forms, thinking, oh, community is just great, it's for a real man, like you see, uh, oh my God, this is from spirituality. Well, we don't uh, read you, chum, I mean, uh, friend, we don't read you as spiritual. We say this is a sentimental and emotional mess. It's a pity, but there you are. So therefore, we say that in order to learn the kind of things which we have learnt or know about, it is necessary to submit oneself to a kind of uh, efficient behaviour corresponding to the efficiency which is required in pursuing any kind of learning. Uh, there is a serious psychological block in the West, because we use words like submit. I mean, if I have to go through a low door, I regard myself as submitting myself to that door, you see. But you mustn't use words like submit in the West, because, <laughs> you know, uh, they don't understand that. They're dirty words. But uh, we really mean this, that if you are very emotional, or you insist on emotional satisfactions, we really do believe that you are not able to perceive other things. And you must therefore make some kind of a decision about it. Either you're going to decide that we are dirty beasts and lunatics or whatever, or you're going to say, well, look, I can take it or I can leave it alone, or I want to learn how, this emotional stimulus, or else, all right, I want my, which is my way of proceeding, I want my due share of emotional stimuli, but I am not a junkie, emotional junkie. Now, it is difficult in a Western society to talk about this, because you only have to switch on the television and you find you are being made into an emotional junkie. That's what they're doing. I mean, that's how they sell things, that's how they uh, excite you, and that's how they keep the great millions and billions of dollars rolling. You say, great. But to assume that if we were less emotional, then we'd disappear into the Atlantic or the Pacific or something. That's a big, big step to make, to assume that. To assume that you're not schmaltzy when you are is also a mistake to make. Schmaltz isn't spirituality. Mistake to make. It should be, in accordance with your experience, as it is of mine, that 
you can only learn something within the limitations laid down by the learning of that thing. For example, you can't hear me if I don't have this microphone, perhaps. I'm submitting to the necessity of it. If I were to speak to you in Japanese, very few of you would probably understand me. I don't know Japanese well, but... So we are submitting to the requirements of a situation. If your doctrine is, ah, oh, well, like I'll kind of run barefoot through the snow and get Satori and Nirvana and Sadhana and Hal and Je ne sais quoi, well, then, according to us, we're not in the same kind of business at all. Now, we, we don't say you're wrong and you've got to come into our kind of business at all, but we do say there has to be some kind of a distinction made in the interest of clarity and in the interest of keeping, as it were, at least our show on the road. I mean, you can look after your own show and you're well able to do so. So, thus far, we're all right. We say every learning has its minimum requirements, every type of learning. Uh, and that it doesn't differ from anything else. Where well, we get the contaminant, as it were, of emotional stimulus, we simply have to point that out. Now, this may seem very obvious, very simple, and very easy to do, but is it really? It isn't. In the event, it's very hard to do, because you only have to see some people simply unable to take this in fact, although they may take it in theory. Unable to take it. They can't take it. So it is hard. Well, so it's hard. Period. There's no more you can say. I mean, you can say it's hard that I can make it easy for you in 28 installments or something. No, it is hard. But it's certainly not impossible and it is not incompatible with your ordinary state of culture or type of civilization. It is strange and unusual in respect to that state of culture and stage of civilization. Now, of course, systems which exist for the purpose of making something possible make assumptions which effectively exclude other things. You can't always do 17 things at a time or something. Or if I'm talking to you now, I can't be doing very many other things at the same time. One thing is excluding the other. Now, the general effect of this, when one wanders around the world watching it, is that people are trained to be able to do only one thing. And they think that, oh, well, you know, if I can do that well, it's good, or I must do this one thing. They're not trained in flexibility. That's rather, you know, suspect. But our tradition is a training in flexibility. So much so that uh, if there weren't so many over-emotional people, so much over-emotionality and sterile religiosity manifested in this area in the West, it would almost be necessary to invent it in order to strike some kind of a balance. That's where people go seriously astray when they try to rely on our classical documents, for example, which came into being in order to make dull people less dull. The people in the West are very excitable at the moment, and therefore some of our traditional materials which cause excitement are a poison to them. So, one must learn to be flexible. One must learn to question assumptions. One must learn to put up other assumptions than one's customary ones to study things. Now, what are the things? Some of the things are our, for example, narrative materials, which I've published quite a lot of. Various kinds of stories and apologues and aphorisms and encounter teaching and this and then the other. Now, various points of view on that produce a certain kind of flexibility, but trying too hard doesn't work. Trying to make out what it means doesn't work, because this material is instrumental, not indoctrination. We believe that it is necessary not ever to regard transient things as constants. And this is rather like saying, in a way, oversimplified is like saying all reality is imagination. Or the world is a jest, shun it. No, all right, that's an oversimplification. Transient thing regarded as a constant is the same as regarding an instrument as a be-all and end-all, making a totem out of a formula and so on. Now, we say one must treat transience as if it were the constant. This is very difficult in Western society because there's a block. Because transience means it'll go away. It means I'll lose it, my property, my life. I'm getting older. I'm going to die. Where am I going? 
I don't want to go away. I want to stay here. I don't want to lose anything. I want to get something. How do I get my piece of the action? Well, that's what it's all based on. Huh? Now, of course, we have this strange paradox, and it is a very strange paradox, that by setting yourself aside from dependence on secondary objects, you actually are able to deal with them much better. In other words, by giving up, you gain. Something which they say in many scriptures, but people <laughs> can't really believe you because they think it's going to come eventually, or whenever, however they put it. So this is one thing to learn. Flexibility. Transience. This is very far from what you and I may automatically, by our assumptions, think of as the Eastern conception of society as static or humanity as a helpless unambitious tool of fate. But we believe that it's people in the West who make themselves a tool of fate or a tool of their surroundings or a tool of almost anything by means of regarding transient things as absolute. You know, I've got a new car. That means I identify myself by means of this car. I tell other people by driving this car or having it what I am and who I am. And, of course, when they repossess it, you feel correspondingly terrible, don't you? It crashes. Well, you're a tool of this transient object. You live through your objects, and people very often say, this is very good, or there's no other way of doing it, and so on. If they do that, then we can't talk to them. All we can do is stand up here and say, look, I, I've got a gold watch, for instance. Well, now, all right, you might say, shh, tut, tut. A spiritual man, of course, I knew he wasn't, but he's got a gold watch, that's all right. You sell it and walking on thorns, hand it over to I don't know whom, who needs it more. Well, okay, if whatever turns you on. I want to point a little thing out to you. The Westerner traditionally tries to dominate his society. That's what he tries to do. I'm going to build a better mousetrap, and you are going to beat a path to my door, that's all. I'm going to storm the gates of heaven. I'm going to pay a hundred bucks and I'm going to find out what this creep is talking about. And this. <laughs> right. Right. Now, that is marvelous. I mean, that is heroism. That is what is going to bring us the smokable five-cent cigar, as it were, as they used to call it. It is going to, yes. It's admirably suited for those things which yield to that sort of behavior. A man comes up to me with a gun in the street. When I walk out of here and demands my money, you think, I'm not going to give it to him. He gets results that way. However, there's a little thing called the creep effect, as it were. One lot of assumptions invading another, or like blotting paper or whatever, creeping into it, produces the kind of mentality of a person who thinks that one Aspirin will banish my headache, and a thousand will give me higher consciousness. Right. Now, it's very common, it's very usual, it's very normal, it's very human, and it's part of a sort of a, uh, a human syndrome. We've all got it. But we've got to learn how to handle it. We cannot have that sort of assumption alone and still learn anything in the metaphysical area. But you can, with those sort of assumptions, constantly produce and maintain a good healthy system of yourself for making yourself think you are religious or happy and spiritual and receiving messages or about to receive any message, well, however they put it. Uh, you can do all those things. What you cannot do is acquire any higher consciousness. You can't use it and it can't use you. All right, that had to be said. Now, here is the Western individual, he thinks I can fight my way out of a paper bag as fast as the next man, is the way we put it, rudely in the rather lower alleyways of a city in the East uh, with which I am acquainted, where I sometimes spend my time. Whereas there's this Eastern fellow who thinks, all right, I will yield. And you know all these stories about the birch tree and the oak and all, I will yield. Or I will see if I can make use of this thing which stands in my way. Now, there are methods of doing that. They cannot be applied, as far as we know, by, as it were, diagrammatic methods, getting them out of a book or listening to them, and then putting them into operation on yourself. 
That's why we haven't yet found a substitute for a dentist, say. You know, you have, there's no machine, you get in and press the button, it pulls out or fills the correct tooth. Well, we have the same problem with those of us who are concerned in the dissemination of this knowledge, that we haven't found a good substitute. Maybe you will one day, but before that we've got to communicate it and get some peace. But I really believe that you may have to some extent, gone down a little bit of a blind alley in the idea of accepting large chunks of assumptions about Eastern philosophy, and even about spiritual people, and what is truth, what is beauty, what is fulfillment, what is this and what is that, because I can easily find out, and often have, what uh, I would have to do in order to convince a significant number of people, a few million, say, that I was a kind of a miraculous, wonder-working, religious, top-level guru or something. Now, when you do a printout, as it were, of this, you, you get very embarrassed at being a human being at all, and you know, living in such company, because you can see it's already been worked out by Madison Avenue, and they, they know how to do it, and this is how a lot of people have done it in the past, and we are all heirs to that flawed tradition. Now, that doesn't mean to say there's any other tradition, but we're all conductors of a lot of that flawed tradition of mushy sentimentalities and self-deception and hypocrisy which we all agree for some assumption requirement situation of our own is truth is beauty is just wonderful is for real is so different from and so on isn't true now have we the courage that the western man is supposed to have to face such a horrible possibility have we? Well, I ask you if you have. Have you got the courage to face it as a possibility without hating yourself, hating me, kicking the dog, or uh, having to <laughs> think of some other way out? I ask you. Now, I say that partly because I do not believe that the importation of complete systems from one place to another is the way in which this thing has been or can be learned. Of course, we know that automimesis is ridiculous. I mean, you put on a loincloth, does that make you more spiritual man? We all know it doesn't. Can you swear that there isn't anybody who thinks he's more spiritual because he's wearing a loincloth? I've seen him wearing a loincloth. But this is 20th century man, remember? I've got this lobe as well, whatever, hemisphere as well working. Rational, sequential mode. I only say this when I'm trying to give you some kind of analogy that it is not necessarily true that the real thing is more complete, more perfect, if you happen to bring it in here straight off the plane from Delhi or Bombay or Karachi or Cairo or whatever. We have to work with a human being in accordance with his possibilities. Now, this penny hasn't dropped, as they say yet. This has not been properly registered. I can tell you how I know because of the correspondence I get and because of the publications I read, which is regurgitated stuff that even some rather less enlightened Easterners who belong to these things very numerously would discard. So you're not getting the prime cut. You're not getting the best version of this stuff even, let alone the complete thing. You're getting a second-rate product very often. Now, in order to try and get that cart back on the rails, why don't we approach this whole problem by getting your thinkers, your hard and soft scientists, to have a look at what we are doing and what we are saying and judge to what extent it is compatible with your experience and your research. And you'll find that there are definite relationships. Like I dug out here something they say that the uh, hard-nosed, hard-science man, uh, materialist, will have nothing to do with spirituality, and yet I see that you've got, Albert Einstein says, quote, the cosmic religious experience is the strongest and noblest driving force behind scientific research. So you've got your own traditions, as it were, here. You've got sayings from your own gurus. There's Albert Einstein, he's your guru, he said that. Now how about it? Now we'll, I can bolt something onto that and we can be in business. But if you want me to teach you Lotus position, then I decline to do so. On the grounds that it is a sociological phenomenon. I don't say insane, because other people are better qualified to judge of it. Dr. Evan Harris Walker, an eminent theoretical physicist, they say is on record as saying, 
Quote, it now appears that research underway offers the possibility of establishing the existence of an agency having the properties and characteristics generally ascribed to the religious concept of God. All right, I'll go along with that. The Sufis, whom your encyclopedias are almost sure to define as Islamic experiential religionists, ecstatics, dancing dervishes, monks, medieval friars and so on, have been baffling outward students of religion for at least a thousand years by discussing in texts continuously extant and notionally religious psychological documents, such things as space travel, atomic power, time-space theory, circulation of the blood, third dimension, aviation, and transmission of pictures to panels set in walls. So what I'm doing is nothing new. There has been an interregnum, there has been a decay in spiritual science and psychological investigation during which the ropier side, the hairier side of guruism has taken over, as it were, and we have Gresham's law, bad drives out good, and I've got to say it, but do not despair. Help is at hand. I am here. So it seems to be not frustration or uh, bankruptcy of ideas which has forced you Western people into trying to uh, seek something in the East because Einstein was probably not so frustrated, or even Dr. Whoever I just mentioned. It is that our paths are now starting to cross. You are looking for something, perhaps, that we've been working with for a long time. We certainly need what you've been working with for a long time. I'm trying to show you a continuum of our kind of thought with... Um, uh, of today with our kind of thought traditionally. I have to establish that what I am saying and doing and my associates is not uh, uh, different from what we've always done and we have to do this ag against the cloud of assumptions that because we uh, don't speak broken English and uh, uh, claim to fly to the moon to do our ablutions as somebody once claimed to my friend Mr. Brent that we are not involved in this question of extra-dimensional perception or understanding of humanity. We are. Now, we have continuously maintained that human beliefs are produced and sustained, for the most part, by the environment, by the culture, and that what people generally call belief is not something which can only be ascribed to divine or diabolical activity, or even to the rightness of something. It is tension, repetition, anxiety, authority fears, canonical literature, and the whole lot. However, the most exciting thing I have ever experienced has been recently when I have at last discovered large numbers of people in the West who are prepared to study what we are trying to do in its own terms. And that doesn't mean to say by a quasi-mystical masquerade and capering. That means according to the assumptions which this system says it wants you to hold for a period in order to investigate something. Now, this is starting to happen in the West. I have to tell you, it is very exciting because, you know, one does begin to see the end of one's life approaching when, after 30, 40 years of uh, this sort of activity, and we are seeing this corner turning. But it's only recently that we really are able to talk to you, just as the man who was talking about how can a tiny speck of something consume a city 900 years ago wouldn't have been listened to 50 or 100 years ago, would he? At last, we've got this possibility of communicating with people in the terms that we need. And so we are able to answer the question, which uh, some famous American once put, uh, and I regard that as quite a metaphysical question, although he probably regarded it as something else. He said, you can take a person away from ignorance, but can you take the ignorance away from a person? And I think, yes, I think it can now be done. Which is quite exciting, because I've been saying it can't be done for so long that even I'm getting tired of the sound of my own voice. <laughs>